Right, good evening everybody and um, warm greetings from, from New Zealand. This is our second meeting today. Uh, I want to acknowledge and thank my colleague Dave Lane, who's joining us now at you know, 9 p.m. this evening. He has a young family. And you know, those of us working in the nonprofit sector don't pay overtime. So I am most appreciative of uh, Dave's contribution this evening. And a very warm welcome to all um, from New Zealand. And I thought we might, because we are a smaller group than we had in uh, this morning, we could, might, could do a quick round of introductions. And I'll just follow the order on my screen as uh, folk had come in. So Paul, I'll hand over to you uh, for a quick introduction. Okay, thanks Wayne. Uh, I'm Paul West, living in Pretoria in South Africa. Um, I have a background with the Commonwealth of Learning, a little bit with the Commonwealth Secretariat, and I'm now an independent consultant working in Pretoria. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks, Paul, and uh, let me hand over to Dave in Christchurch. Hello all, yes, Dave Lane in Christchurch, about four hours drive north of, of Wayne. Uh, in the South Island of New Zealand. Um, I'm actually a software engineer and research scientist by training, but I'm now turning my hand to education and loving it. Glad to be amongst you. Wayne, you have, I think you're on mute. I think that's why people aren't hearing you. <laughs> this is true. I had my own mic on mute. Sorry about that. Um, next on my list, uh, Mr. Suli from Nigeria. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Anu Suli from National Open University of Nigeria in West Africa. Uh, okay. My background is in software engineering. And, uh, now I'm the acting head of OER, our Open Education resources. Uh, it's actually my first time in participating in, a, in an online meeting like this we go on in this forum. Thank you. Mr. Suli, you're most welcome and uh, now we have two software engineers so it's going to be an interesting discussion. <laughs> Moving uh, next, uh, next on the list uh, I have uh, Yaku Ulifi from Northwest. Good morning, yes, thank you very much. Um, my name is Jaco Olifir, as you said correctly there. Um, I'm from North East University, and I'm also leading the UNESCO Chair for OER and Multimodal Learning at our university. And yes, my background is more in line with blended learning and multimodal learning. And um, yes, I hope we can uh, get a lot done and get, get some collaboration going, thanks. Thanks very much, Jaku. It's uh, good to have the UNESCO, UNESCO Chair Network well represented at the meeting, so that's all good. Uh, next on the list, uh, Andrew from the UK. Hi, Andrew Laura. I work for the Open University United Kingdom. Um, been here for about 10 years, mostly running their informal learning programs, so everything we do in the public domain with the BBC, but also on Open Learn and our content on Future Learn, the commercial MOOC engine. Yeah. And uh, congratulations on your 60 millionth visitor uh, recently on Open it. Learn. That's an impressive achievement. <laughs> yep, okay. sure did. Um, next on the list is Serene. My name is Serena al -Salhad. I'm the Vice Chancellor for International Cooperation and Corporate Communication at Hamdan Muhammad Smart University. We're the first smart university in the UAE and the region. So looking forward to this meeting. And yeah, I, I was thinking the same thing, Wayne. We have so many engineers and it's going to be a very uh, intriguing chat and discussion. So looking forward to it. It's going to be interesting. I, I think I feel a tad intimidated because uh, I'm, I'm not an engineer. So this is going to be interesting. Uh, next, uh, moving to, next on the list, um, Rassi from Northwest University. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Rassi Lowe. I'm um, the manager for the teaching and learning environment at Northwest University. And in that capacity, I've been networking with Wayne and uh, OERU University of Wayne. It's now for a number of years. And uh, yeah, we hosted um, OERU in South Africa about two years ago. 
So I would I, I want to see myself as an ambassador for the for the whole notion of OER at our university and then also in Southern Africa. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. Yes, uh, Northwest University, the meeting that was held there in 2015, you set a high bar uh, in terms of the standard of entertainment for the colleagues that have uh, you know, attended the meeting. Um, so it will be interesting to see what our Australians uh, have in store for us in November. Uh, next on the list, I have um, Andy, I assume it's Andy Brown from uh, uh, University of the Highlands and Islands. Hi Wayne, yes that's me. Um, I'm the Head of Academic Development in the University of the Highlands and Islands in the north of Scotland. Um, I, my background is in archaeozoology and e-learning and uh, I'm involved in the OERU first year of study. Thanks very much Andy and as you'll see a bit later in the meeting played a very significant role in helping us get the articulation agreements uh, off the ground, which I think is a significant achievement for the OERU. And uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Carol from the UK. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, good evening, or whatever time of day it is, wherever you are. Uh, yes, thank you, Wayne. Um, I'm sorry that I've got no uh, camera on at the moment. Um, I've uh, been working with Wayne on doing some of the instructional design to get the courses ready for the first year of study and uh, that's been really enjoyable. My background is in um, originally nursing but then uh, education and I worked with Wayne at one of the universities in New Zealand and now I'm back living in the UK. Thank you. Thanks very much Carol. So let me just shift things around here a bit and get a bit of a screen share going. Uh, in theory, that should be coming through now. So basically what you should be seeing on screen is the copy of our agenda page. And uh, we can then move on with the agenda, if that's okay. Um, just a quick overview of the uh, purpose of the meeting uh, to review progress with the first year of study. Uh, just to note a couple of the improvements with the MVP uh, delivery platform on the technology side. Uh, this is also a meeting where we're having one of our consultations on the OERU strategic plan for uh, 2018 through to 2021. And in the traditions of the OERU, we always have an open consultation meeting to discuss the proposed agenda for the OERU partners meeting. So uh, that's what we hope to cover. Uh, this evening. Um, getting back down here to the agenda. I also want to note, and uh, this is going to help us tremendously with uh, moving the rate at which we get the courses launched for the first year of study, uh, Otago Polytechnic has contributed uh, an additional full FTE from their staff uh, to work full time on helping us uh, with the launch of all these uh, courses for the first year of study. And that's a role that will be shared by two colleagues at Otago Polytechnic. I posted an announcement uh, a while back. Um, that's uh, Claire Good and uh, Simone Wood. And of interest, both uh, UK expats um, from her. So it seems to me we're getting a bit of a hostile takeover a bit from uh, the UK. But uh, we'll move on from there. Um, this doesn't apply to this meeting because we've had the introductions. Um, what I'd like to do now is just give a quick overview of the delivery platform. Now, I do apologize. I know a couple of folk in the meeting are familiar with what the OERU courses look like, uh, but a number of you would not have seen uh, the delivery platform, and I think it's valuable for us to have a quick look at how that all fits together, because uh, uh, that will help a lot with understanding how the strategic plan has been put together and how we're implementing the OERU first year of study. So basically how this works is we publish all our micro courses. Each of our full courses are assembled as micro courses and we publish them on a WordPress site. Uh, all the content is authored on the back end using Wiki Educator, which gives us version control. And uh, we have a script which runs, which then publishes to WordPress. And so these micro courses are assembled from a collection of learning pathways 
um, individual learning pathways are divided into sub pages. Which learners, you know, navigate through the activities um, are embedded in the, you know, the relevant pages where learners, you know, can interact with each other and work through the course materials. Each micro course equates to roughly 40 notional learning hours. Uh, in New Zealand credit terms, that's about four credits. In North American credit terms, uh, because I believe uh, in, in Dubai you use the American credit system, so a micro course would really equate to one credit in, in, in your world. Um, where this starts getting interesting, the whole philosophy of the OERU is to have a think about, well, how will, how will we deliver open education in the fourth, you know, in a decent, uh, the world that is evolving to become the decentralized web, which some people are calling Web 3.0. And so what we've done is we've actually built a component-based system uh, comprising best-of-breed open source technologies, which are distributed across the internet uh, to provide interaction support for uh, our learners on the courses. Uh, we host our own social media platform called Mastodon, which is an open source alternative to Twitter, but a very interesting piece of technology because it is a federated technology, meaning that any institution would be able to easily set up their own instance of Mastodon and uh, have their posts federated with the rest of the Fed, the Fedverse, as they say. Uh, individual learners post the outputs of their learning on course blogs. Uh, we have an internal commenting engine in our, on our course site called Wiki Educated Notes. We also make use of the open source hypothesis engine, uh, which is an amazing open source uh, technology that enables learners to annotate uh, any web page uh, on the internet. Uh, we have a social bookmarking engine, uh, which is our OERU course repository. Uh, we encourage learners to go out and find open access resources in support of their learning, which they are able to share with um, uh, each other. I'm just going to mute the mics which are active at the moment. There we go, because I'm just getting a bit of back feed here. And uh, we use the discourse discussion forum engine for, uh, you know, the learner discussion forums. And we have uh, we use syndication technologies uh, to harvest and bring these mentions and posts from all these distributed technologies together in a single course feed. And so, for example, you will see here, this is a post uh, that I posted yesterday evening as an example. It was a blog post which I tagged with the course code, so it is harvested by the feed. Here's an example of an internal comment from the course site. This is an example of a post that came from one of uh, the, uh, the discourse discussion forum. Here are links that were shared on bookmarks. So you get the idea. We have the ability of uh, harvesting these interactions from different technologies on the web. Um, hypothesis is of particular interest. Uh, here is a, a, a page which learners have been commenting on. It's an article that was written by Maha Bailey on uh, you know defi or defining the difference or between digital skills and digital literacies which is one of the articles in the first course in learning in the digital age and basically what learners are able to do is you know they can highlight any section uh, on the web page and post an annotation you'll see here on the right of the screen uh, a, a text area box should appear i'm obviously getting a little bit of latency at the moment um, here we go so you'll see here's a text box so learners can comment on you know, any article on the web or a PDF that has been uploaded on the web. And as long as they add the course code, uh, the course tag, we are, will be able to harvest that uh, for the course feed. That's uh, at a high level uh, what the OERU delivery platform looks like. Um, in relation to this, we are also uh, implementing at the OERU what we are calling uh, a perpetual academic year. And what, what we mean by that is simply each micro course that we will have in the first year of study will have four offerings. They will have three cohort based offerings with fixed start dates and fixed finish dates, plus an open independent study option. 
Now, if you start doing the mental math around that, um, a first year of, uh, a full year of study equates to 30 micro courses. And if you've got four offerings of um, each micro course, we are dealing with 240 offerings each year. So we've had to think quite carefully about scalability issues. Uh, for a small nonprofit like ourselves, which only has two staff members, we've got to think of clever ways of automating uh, a number of the support capabilities and uh, communications that go out to learners. And how we do that is by making use of marketing automation software. Uh, we host a piece of software called Mortic, uh, which is a, an open source marketing automation software which has the ability of sending out pre-programmed and automated emails within uh, dedicated campaigns. Commensurate with the recommendations at the, OER, the 2017 OERU Partners Meeting, we've done a little work in improving the landing pages of the individual courses and their associated micro courses. So what I'm gonna show you here is an example of the uh, landing page for introduction to project management. And as you'll see there, introduction to project management uh, comprises four micro courses. You can see them listed there. And uh, using elaboration theory, uh, visitors to this page are able to click and then access more detailed information as they require. So essentially they have two options if they have interest and want to uh, sign up for the course. Um, they are directed to a landing page, which gives a, a high-level summary of the course, uh, what the benefits of taking the course are. And by signing up here, we will then associate them with a Mortic um, you know, email campaign, which I'll talk a little bit, uh, I'll talk a little bit about this more in a moment or two. Um, the, these landing pages also give us the, the ability that when we start implementing uh, pay-per-click advertising campaigns, that those ads appearing in those advertising campaigns will then link through to these landing pages, which will help us with lead capture and support uh, for our learners. Uh, in addition, uh, a key philosophy for us at the OERU uh, as an open project is the fact that no learner should be required to register a password in order to gain access to the learning materials. And so a learner may choose to, you know, go directly to the course materials and actually start working through the learning pathways without the need to register a password in order to access the materials. Uh, however, if a learner does want to post on the discussion forums, uh, we do require password registration for two reasons. One is uh, spam management, but more importantly, the ability to attribute uh, posts to the learners they belong to. So that's more or less how the uh, platform sits together. Um, what I do want to show you quickly is uh, the Mautic um, engine. Uh, I wonder if I've got one loaded here. Doesn't look like it. Let me just do a quick search here and show you what a Mautic campaign looks like. Uh, so wait for that to load. So if I've still got a current session. Yeah, no, that looks fine. So what I'm going to show you here is just an example of a email campaign that is used for a cohort offering. So this was the Leader 101, the first cohort offering, the campaign that was used. And so basically how this works is any learner who says, hey, I'm interested in Leader 101, I want to participate as, 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 for cohort-based study, they are assigned to this campaign, we allocate the tags that help us manage the campaign or, or these leads within our system. Um, they'll immediately receive the orientation email, which will give them instructions on how to proceed, as well as the opportunity to complete the preferences survey, where learners can opt in for receiving uh, orientation instructions on how to get started with our technologies. And in this particular example, on the 14th of March, they would get the email for session one. On the 19th of March, they would get the email for session two, uh, 22nd of March, email for session three, and so forth, and so forth. Uh, we have the ability uh, of knowing more or less when a learner might be considering assessment options, if they are thinking about assessment, 
for formal credit. And at this point, we are able to inject marketing collateral from our partner institutions that are offering assessment services uh, for transcript credit for that particular course. So that gives uh, sort of a, a, an, an idea or a concept of how these campaigns work. They actually get quite sophisticated um, in terms of the decision making. Uh, of course, now when I'm looking for an example, I don't have it here. But uh, what we're able to do is build in Boolean decision logic uh, into these campaigns. So based on preferences that um, learners express, we can customize the communications that are going out to them. Um, and that's what's happening on the Mortic back end. So let me just leave that there for the time being and open up the floor for any comments or questions uh, in relation to the delivery platform. So if you're a small enough group, you just take the mic. Paul? Wayne, can I come in? Absolutely. I, thank you. I think what you're doing is excellent. This is uh, much more advanced than what I saw the last time I was involved with the OER. You, um, I really think that what you're doing will help a lot with some of the ideas that I think people are starting to throw around. There are just millions of people who are not able to get through formal education and they're just not going to be able to do it within their lifetimes and possibly a second generation even. So I think the platforms that you're putting together are excellent for this. Um, uh, I think that's, I can just about leave it there. There are, are many barriers that one needs to still work through. Um, but I think what you've done is, is really brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Paul, thank you very much. We've, I mean, we've had the help of many folk who, you know, volunteered and contributed time. In fact, the whole open source software community um, I mean, we are able to piggyback and build and take the best of the open source world and start, you know, stitch it together. Uh, I do agree with you. I think there are many barriers and challenges we need to overcome, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, around optimal ways of uh, presenting this information. But the fact that this is all open source and it's uh, the engine at the back has semantically clean markup means, in theory, we can start scripting. Uh, single page mobile apps, so for example, that learners don't have to consume bandwidth uh, in order to access the materials. And so there are smart things that one can be doing in the future as we uh, you know, get more funding and more capacity to, uh, to be doing these things. Uh, the other big advantage with the model that we've got, it, it is, uh, in, it's quite possible, uh, because this is all open source, Dave will uh, point to examples of this. We actually publish the technical recipes of all the technologies we're using, which means that any institution, even uh, institutions that aren't partners of the OVRU, would be able to replicate those technologies locally uh, for replicating their own uh, distributed uh, systems like this. Uh, we also have uh, opportunities of doing what we call open boundary format courses where we can publish multiple instances of the same course materials. So you could have the OERU course site. Uh, there could be you know, a library site in Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya, that is running a copy of this. Um, Sailor Foundation can have a copy of the course in, you know, in their learning management system. And with these distributed uh, syndication technologies, these learner cohorts can actually interact with each other. So the, there's lots of opportunity for doing some very, very interesting things. Uh, but it's the fact that we've got this disaggregated model. Um, but it's, you know, it's a slow cook model. A lot of work needs to be done um, and you know, we're taking it one step at a time. Yeah. Any other questions? Wayne, uh, actually I want to ask, um, uh, because I haven't been part of the conversation for a while now, because of uh, internal uh, changes here at the university, what, what would be the possibility of posting these courses of the OERU on a uh, OER repository like Merlot for a better uptake around the world? Because there's a number of well, people in South Africa, for example, access Merlot to, 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 to join courses, which is offered 
uh, as complete courses and also micro-credentialing courses through Merlo. What would be the possibility? Uh, quite possibly. Uh, Rossi, if you can just mute your mic again. Uh, of course, it's quite possible. I mean, this is all open source. Anybody who wants to spend a, bit of, a little bit of time uh, developing a script to publish to their target environment uh, could do so tomorrow. Uh, there is no restriction whatsoever in doing that. I mean, obviously, we don't have the uh, uh, code uh, code development capacity right now uh, to be working on, you know, scripting those kinds of exports. But there is no technical barrier or limitation to doing that. You know, it's just a question of time of having, you know, a dedicated in, uh, software engineer, you know, just you know, taking a look at, the, uh, you know, taking a look at how this all sits together and. Uh, you know, dumping a static HTML version of this is actually not that hard. Uh, we have a working prototype. It's just a little bit rough on the edges. Um, so if you have any development capacity at Northwest University, uh, any coders there, I'd be happy to have a conversation with them. Uh, and, you know, we can progress that agenda. Thanks, uh, Wayne. Wayne. Yes, uh, we had another question there. I'm not sure who it was from. Wayne, I was about to say something. It's Paul here. Paul, um, go ahead, please. I've had a couple of comments from private sector institutions that are interested in sharing materials. Um, the, the scenario is this, that they receive funding or they find the course is marketable for a number of years, and then once they've covered all their costs on it, then it becomes a marginal course, and they're willing to give away the contents. Yep. Um, but they're sitting there with this contents, and they say, well, if you want to do something, you can do something with it. And it may not be the ideal stuff. It could be a series of PDFs even, but it's stuff that they can pay to do, sometimes contracted by government to produce years ago, three or four years ago, not that old, and uh, it's available, but that's where it stops. So there's this big jump from how does one get from that to making it available fully? So there's the technology side of it. And secondly, they all have different requests with copyright. You know those arguments, we've had them a long time. Yeah. But they're all willing to go with the uh, CC license, but possibly the most restrictive of the CC licenses with the, with the request to say, come back to us to talk if you want to customize the material. It's little niggly things like that, but there's a lot of material available. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, from, from the copyright licensing questions, I mean, uh, it's, um, you know, it's, an, it's an interesting conversation, but in my experience, when you sit down, and explain the benefits of a copyleft license, uh, smart people understand that there's no commercial risk uh, in doing that. Um, in, if, if anything, it adds value to their own business. Uh, in terms of getting the capacity to do that conversion, one of the ideas we are thinking about, and perhaps this is something we can discuss later around our innovation pilots, is uh, this concept of we, uh, we'll be implementing a, a course in uh, digital skills for collaborative OER development, uh, where we actually uh, provide capacity support to learners how to assemble courses using these kinds of technologies. And then we could have those learners engage in using materials that have been given, uh, you know, under an open license to convert them uh, in ways that uh, add value to the ecosystem. So that might be a way in which we can start thinking about capacity of making, you know, making that happen. Uh, and again, it's, you know, it's a kind of innovation pilot I would love to explore. If there are no other questions, um, in the OERU traditions, we take silence to mean assent. And so we, uh, I'll move on to the, the next item in the agenda, and that is just to uh, give you a high-level report back on the uh, launch of the OERU first year of study. So at the uh, Council of CEOs meeting and the partners meeting, we agreed that we would launch the first year of study uh, in February, uh, and the, the course has been rolled as we move forward. Um, and it was a good plan. And we, uh, when we started working through the detail, as you'll see there, the devil is in the detail, we realized there was a bunch of stuff that we needed to get done in all, before we could actually you know, proceed with all the, the launch of all the courses. Uh, but it's been all good. One of the things that needed to be done was the development of 
the learner support site. Um, so when I got back from my vacation at the end of January, we realized we, we do not have a learner support site uh, published. And so we spent a bit of time developing the learner support site. So our learners now have, you know, got sporting materials on, you know, how to study with the OERU, uh, how the micro courses work, um, how you set up all the different technologies in, on the platform. There are um, screencast videos. And so we have that support site, which radically reduces the number of questions that come through from learners because it's a resource that they can go to in order to help to get started. Uh, when we'd finished that, we then moved on to uh, getting the back end of our uh, marketing automation uh, sorted. Uh, we initially used a software service model uh, provided by Mortic.com, uh, where you, uh, you, you know, they would host this, uh, where you, you, know, you just buy in the service. Um, but as it turned out, uh, at the beginning of the year, they changed their pricing model, uh, which uh, eventually ended up being totally unaffordable for us at the OER Foundation. I mean, just to give you a bit of a sense of how they structured their model, um, anybody can use the Mautic uh, software automation system for free. You're limited to 5,000 contacts in your database. Uh, but where things get tricky is they rate limit the number of emails that you send out each uh, that you can send out each day. So you can imagine when you're running a, a bunch of courses, uh, you'll quickly uh, exceed the you know 100 email uh, per day limit. Uh, obviously, on the, the support plans, you uh, you know you aren't restricted by those email limits. Uh, but the pricing model is based on the number of contacts. Uh, as opposed to the number of active contacts at any given time. Um, so in the OERU context, you will see that our uh, contacts will accumulate uh, uh, exponentially as learners take courses. But once they finish the course, they're no longer active. And, you know, at pricing mo uh, models of in excess of 500 US a month, there is absolutely no way uh, that we could uh, afford to do that. But of course, being smart, uh, all our technology is open source. So we decided to bite the bullet and uh, host our own instance uh, of Mautic. Uh, it's an incredibly powerful piece of software. I, I'm astounded by what it does. Um, but with all impressive pieces of software, the learning curve is quite steep uh, in terms of you know, setting up these campaigns, figuring out how it all works. But in hindsight, I think our decision to host ourselves was a good one. I mean, our database at the moment is currently, you know, just short of 13,000 contacts. Um, and we've already sent out, uh, you know, just short of 20,000 emails uh, after the launch of the first couple of courses. So, um, you know, that far exceeds the, the daily limit of 100 emails. So this has been a, 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 an affordable solution for us. It, we might be worth, uh, sorry, wait, it might be worth mentioning that uh, rather than $500 per month, we're now only actually paying for the outgoing emails that we send, and that's about a dollar for 50000 So we're spending on the order of $0.20 cents per month or so compared to $500. <laughs> so it's been a fairly substantial savings. Yep. So that's been a good investment for us uh, over the longer term. Uh, the shorter term, it was a bit of a challenge because that was another six weeks, you know, out of our capacity in terms of getting the stuff ready to proceed with the launching of all the courses. Um, you will also be familiar. I'm pleased that there are a good number of folk from the uh, from the UK. Uh, you, you'll be familiar with the GDPR. Uh, the, general data protection regulation that came in with the European Union. I'm not sure what the impact is in, uh, after Brexit with uh, GDPR, but um, I'm sure you'll be able to enlighten me. Um, but as it turns out, we are actually not legally bound by a, a GDPR because of the size of our operation. We are below the uh, revenue thresholds and the number of staff in our organization. But data protection is something that is very important to us. And so we wanted to make sure that we were GDPR compliant because you know, it's well aligned with our, uh, our DNA. 
but also would be comforting for our partners in Europe. So we've uh, revised our privacy policy. We've done the necessary around the privacy notices, which requires quite a bit of detail in terms of what data you're collecting, uh, how you're using that data and for what purposes. So we have detailed descriptions of all the data we hold, uh, how we're processing it, you know, the reasons we're processing it. Uh, so we are now GDPR compliant. Um, once, once we'd managed to get through that, we were in a position to launch our first course, uh, Learning in a Digital Age. Uh, we didn't advertise or market widely. Uh, for those of you with a bit of experience in software and new technologies, you know, don't overload the system too soon. Uh, you want to make sure that everything's going to work. Uh, so we didn't advertise at all. Uh, I posted, I think, two tweets and maybe a post on the Wiki Educated discussion list, and uh, that was that was about it. We um, had 703 registered participants and 659 unregistered participants, so we can obviously track uh, unique users that are visiting the site who haven't actually registered for participation. So that's roughly about 40% of folk who engage in the course materials who actually don't register an account, which is quite an interesting statistic. Um, we, we had folk from 60 different countries. Uh, you can see the clusters of the, uh, the top countries, but I'll show some other data there, which might be more interesting. Uh, we also run a, a new participant survey, uh, which is an optional survey. Um, the the, uh, the response rates are typically low for these kinds of surveys. We get about 10% of folk responding to these surveys, but nonetheless, uh, we're getting a bit of idea of the data of the learners that are engaging here. Um, you know, clearly mature adults, um, um, the vast majority being over 25 years of age, uh, big cluster around the 46 and older uh, group. Um, in terms of uh, language, 42% um, English first language, 38% second language. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the gender that uh, learners identify with, the data we've got so far, 51% female, 30% male. Um, reasonable uh, spread around the world. I am particularly pleased to see, um, you know, numbers from Sub-Saharan Africa. Typically when you see these graphs, you know, Africa is sitting around about two or three percent. So I'm, I'm pleased that there are learners from, you know, Africa engaging. Um, majority of, well, um, about 45 percent of folk in full-time employment. Uh, with the remainder in varying positions of part-time employment, uh, which is also an interesting stat. Um, interesting, I, I was quite surprised by this. 59% of participants had participated in an online learning course before. I, I would have imagined those rates to be a bit lower. So that's quite interesting. Uh, main reasons for engaging in learning, professional development. Um, is the big one. So I mean, that's an interesting stat, uh, particularly around our micro-credentialing initiatives, uh, because all our courses carry micro-credentials uh, that are mapped to formal university credit uh, for learners who want to opt in for formal university credit. Uh, this is an interesting question. We ask these respondents, uh, you know, we do offer these micro-credentials. Are you interested in taking them? 32% uh, of, uh, of the respondents, yep, we want to do these things. Um, the interesting one, uh, about 35% will consider it. So, um, you know, if we focus on this group, uh, we could um, you know, have better conversions around, you know, people getting uh, credentials that can help, help them along. So that's pretty much a high-level summary of the data we've collected so far. I must stress, it's still early days in the data. Um, I wouldn't recommend drawing too many inferences from such a small sample. Uh, but as we start collecting more data, um, it, it, you know, obviously the reliability levels will increase uh, to assist our decision making. 
So let me leave it there uh, and ask if there are any questions, comments, thoughts, suggestions. Wayne, can I just check something? Sure. Um, is it all mobile friendly? Because especially the continent like Africa, we've got to think about people accessing with small screens. Yep. So um, all our technologies are mobile responsive. Um, so if you were to look at uh, an example of the course, uh, if we do this, I should be able to, let me do it like this. There we go. So, you, you know, you see you're getting the, the mobile small, small screen uh, responsiveness happening there. Um, so we do pay, pay a lot of attention to responsive design. Uh, there are certainly areas for improvement. Um, you know, we are aware of a couple of niggles that we'd like to you know, tighten up and get better. But um, yeah, we, we are very cognizant of the fact that you know, mobile devices are important. And in terms of our own data, uh, Wiki Educator, for example, which isn't a good example of mobile <laughs> responsive design, but it was never intended for that purpose. Um, we've crossed the halfway threshold of number of visits from mobile devices when compared to desktops. And um, I'm sure when it, you know, it comes to the learning materials, at the moment, our data is around about 40% uh, of folk are accessing the course materials from either a mobile device or a tablet. Um, but I suspect that's going to increase as we start widening, uh, you know, uh, in you know the developing parts of the world. Yeah. I mean, what the, the penetration rate in Africa? I'm sure it's by far the majority of access to the internet now. Paul, do you know often what those stats are? I don't have uh, stats on it, but I gather it is majority mobile. Wayne, the other comment I can make is um, the credentialing. You have mentioned micro-credentials. I think those are, are very crucial. And mapping those back into countries is important. This country I'm sitting in, South Africa, is probably one of the most picky of the lot. That it, It's an example then of how the local authorities want everything mapped against um, local qualifications. Um, but they haven't gone as far as micro credentials. They go down to what's it called? Um, it's smaller units of your learning, but they're still pretty big. Yeah. So, so I mean, how how we're working here is we, uh, we've partnered with EduBits, which is a micro credentialing initiative that is led out of the Targa Polytechnic. Um, and 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 so how the system works? Uh, there are a couple of prongs to this whole uh, micro credentialing thing. Um, but how we work internally for the formal academic credit with our partners is each of the micro courses that goes, you know, goes through a full course approval. So there will be the four micro courses or the three micro courses that are approved as short courses by academic board that are mapped to the identical learning outcomes of the full course, right? So it's, it's effectively the three or the four subsections of the full course with their individual course approval, short course approvals. Um, because the, uh, the institution is an approved accredited institution, they have authority through the New Zealand Qualifications Authority to issue transcript credit uh, for the, the, you know, these approved courses. And so the work that we've done with colleagues at the University of the Highlands and Islands and Thomas Edison State University in the articulation agreements uh, have the contracts in place which ensure credit transfer mapped to the credentials of the conferring institution. So in this case for the first year of study uh, we have uh, with organic, there are two exit qualifications that we're starting with. The one is the certificate of higher education business uh, that will be conferred by the University of the Highlands and Islands. So 60 of the 120 credits are, are assessed externally in order to meet the uh, residency requirements at uh, University of Highlands and Islands. The other OERU courses for the other 60 credits will be assessed by the University of the Highlands and Islands. So that's pretty much how 
the micro credentialing stuff works at, at the moment, but of which is of interest. Uh, the New Zealand Qualifications Authority just recently, a couple of weeks ago, approved micro credentials as part of the formal qualification structure. And so this opens up the avenue, certainly within New Zealand, for us to approve uh, micro credentials from sets of OERU courses. Um, there's a lot of conversation in Australia with the qualifications authority there around you know, these ideas of micro-credentialing. I'm sure in good time uh, in South Africa, those conversations will take place. But there's nothing that would restrict, for example, a South African uh, partner like Northwest University to offer assessment services according to their standards and their quality using the OERU courses and then signing the articulation agreement with uh, the University of the Highlands and Islands, at least providing a pathway for uh, learners in South Africa to get a formal recognized qualification uh, while South Africa is refining their micro-credentialing initiative. Any other questions? Uh, one a question from my side then. So currently this formal agreement that you have in place between the early RU is only with Thomas Edison and the uh, University of Ireland and Ireland? Correct, yes. So as the first phase of the first step in this process, we've worked with bilateral agreements uh, because they're more achievable, uh, because the individual courses are clearly stipulated that UHI will approve for credit transfer because I mean there are a number of uh, is, uh, issues that are important there uh, in terms of the its quality standards at the University of the Highlands and Islands. What I might just do here is because we have one of the representatives, Andy, who was instrumental in helping us uh, draft and develop the articulation agreements, um, whether you'd be able to respond from uh, the University of the Highlands and Islands perspective, Andy, if that's okay? I'm sorry, I've had to mute, um, I've had to kill my video because I'm having terrible connectivity problems here. Um, could you repeat the question, please? Oh, so the, um, we, were, we were discussing the uh, articulation agreements um, and the, um, I was talking about at the moment we're working with bilateral agreements. In other words, that is a clear, uh, clearly specified in the contract which courses the uh, UHI will recognize for credit transfer purposes as opposed to having a kind of a blanket model. Um, and, and yeah, so, uh, so um, yes. the, question the question really is, um, as far as I, I see it, in theory, it would be possible for Northwest University as an accredited institution uh, to approach Northwest University uh, with the same uh, agreement uh, for you know any courses to be considered for credit transfer across to you guys absolutely and um, they would have to fall within um, uh, because we're doing the cert he business so the courses would have to fall within what we would recognize for the first year yeah. of business at the university but um, if they wanted to offer a module or a course which fell into that, for instance, marketing or, or something at a first year level, that would be fine. We would just enter into an articulation agreement with them. Um, right. And we've left ours open so that we, we don't have to go through the validation process again. It's understood that other universities could offer courses we would merely enter into an articulation agreement with them. So yeah, we're completely flexible. They're delighted to have um, as many courses on board as, as uh, OERU partners want to offer. Um, the, uh, the only requirement which you've already mentioned, Wayne, is that we have to ex um, assess three courses because that then gives the residence, yeah. uh, residential yeah. requirement, uh, which we need to be able to award the qualification. Yeah. But how the other 60 credits are made up is entirely up to the students and depends on the offering from the rest of the partners. Uh, yeah, I mean, which is great news, and uh, it, you know, it's how we designed the the system. So, Northwest University could offer assessment services for each of the business courses 
that have already been approved uh, as long as you know the articulation agreement is signed because there are a bunch of requirements around sort of quality control and you can't sort of uh, subcontract the assessment services and that sort of thing to make sure that you know the the, the quality is up to speed yep and what we're doing uh, for our three <coughs> courses is um, the assessment will be a project work that the student has to do um, they have to uh, get a minimum pass mark for that project work. Once they've got that minimum pass mark, they then have to um, undergo um, a viva, um, and that's a 15 minute viva to ensure that they are the people that have submitted yeah. that work. So they'll be quizzed about the, uh, it'll be a reflective process on how they went about answering the questions. Um, should they fail that viva, then it doesn't matter what they got for their project work, they will not get credit because it's the only way we can ensure that they're the people that did the work. Yeah, um, and, and that's an important piece, ensuring that you know, the person uh, earning the award actually did the work. <laughs> it's quite important, yeah. Yeah. strict on that so, so anybody yeah, that, that wants to offer assessments uh, um, has to it um, was responsible for the work and it wasn't an essay mill or anything of that nature do, do you have that problem in the uk <laughs> <laughs> yes giving everybody headaches at the moment <laughs> yeah fair enough Okay, so I, I, Paul, I think that uh, answers your, your questions on some of the micro credentialing stuff as well as Rassi. So we must continue this conversation. I mean, you know, we can give you a half a business degree or a half of a first year of study. Uh, you don't have to spend a cent on development cost. Uh, you would have market advantage because providing assessment services in local currency as opposed to US dollars. Um, you know, it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, to widen access to provision to all those learners who don't qualify for seats. Uh, and so this is my concern. Um, is not so much the people that qualify to get you know government subsidy and seats in the higher education system. I mean, it's all the kids that don't make the cut um, that can't afford uh, you know study at all. And this is a way in in widening that access. Um, so we must definitely have that conversation. Okay, so if there are no more questions, there's just one uh, facet I want to um, mention and report here with regards to the first year of study. Um, Andy reminded me um, of the exemplary uh, handbook that she developed for the Certificate of Higher Education Business, which we have yet to you know, publish on the site. And with some embarrassment, I, I must say that we've just been overloaded with work. We haven't got round to that yet. So, uh, Andy, I, th I thank you for reminding me. Uh, we'll, we need to get on to that and get that sorted pretty soon. Thanks, Wayne. Okie dokie. So that's around the uh, first year of study. Uh, what we'd like to do uh, now is just uh, highlight one, uh, well, two technology improvements that we've been working on. You know, as as we've worked through the launch of the um, the first year of study with these first couple of courses, you know, we know where the uh, teething problems are and the things that uh, folk have been struggling with. And so we've been involved with a bit of software development there to attend to some of these challenges. So I'm going to hand over to um, Dave in Christchurch. Thanks, Wayne. Like um, stop my screen share so you can use it. Sure. Okay. Um, so yes, uh, as you're aware, we're a fairly uh, lean foundation with only two, well, we now have three full-time staff uh, comprised of four different people, but um, up until very recently, it was only the two of us. And so we have limited capacity for doing serious software development or, or uh, a lot of other things as well. Um, so what we do is we tend to use best of breed open source uh, tools. Uh, we, we assess different tools and we see how they fit into our overall um, mix of, of, of service offerings. Uh, and then every now and again, um, I'm called on to um, kind of glue things together in a way that, you know, provide the strategic, one crucial strategic piece of software that, that will uh, 
potentially unlock the potential of, of all of these different um, of these different other open source components. And one of the things that uh, you, you would have seen that Wayne showed earlier was the idea that um, a, a learner can nominate a blog alongside their registration on our course site so that if they post a blog entry which is tagged with the course tag that they're taking part in, uh, it will automatically be harvested or scanned by uh, an automated service that we manage as part of our wiki educator notes. Um, so it pulls a reference to any suitable blog posts and it puts them in that interactive feed that you, you may recall from earlier in the, in the, the meeting. Um, we ran into an interesting problem uh, when we first made it possible for learners to associate a blog with their uh, account, a blog address with their account. And the problem we ran into was that what we actually need is the specific address of a machine readable feed, um, something like an RSS feed, or a, you may or may not be familiar with this idea, but most blogs by default have a, a, um, a kind of uh, view that you can point a computer at and it will actually see the content on the blog and it will be able to do things like identify tags and uh, associated with blog posts and it allows us to do an automated scanning of people's blogs relatively efficiently. Problem was that people when they entered their blog URL weren't really sure what a blog feed was and we were getting we had hundreds of people put in blog URLs, um, blog web addresses, but almost none of them were valid. <laughs> um, and it was mostly because uh, these were people that were just doing our learning in a digital age course and they hadn't yet become familiar with some of these concepts. So anyway, it turns out that we had a lot of information that um, wasn't very useful. And so it became apparent that we needed to provide some way of helping people figure out what the address of their blog's feed is. So most people can work out where their blog is, they can go to it and they can edit the blog. Um, but when they're asked to provide the feed um, address, then, then they're a little bit uh, puzzled by it. So anyway, we one of our strategic um, developments was to develop this uh, concept of a blog feed finder. And I'll just, um, I'll just share my screen here as soon as I can find the window. So yes, we tried to make uh, something that would be very, very straightforward for learners to uh, get their heads around. Um, it's this very simple single page, a single form entry, and it instructs the learner to go to their blog in their browser in a different tab in their browser, um, or mobile device if they're using a mobile device, and to copy and paste the address of their blog from the uh, address bar of their browser. And um, I'll just show you what would happen, for example. So uh, I should also mention that um, I maintain a blog of our technology uh, activities. So it's called the tech, it's, it, you'll be able to see it here. It's called tech.oeru.org. Um, sorry, I hit enter too early here. And um, it happens to have a feed, so I'll use that as a test. So essentially what happens is you can put in your the address of your blog and it will actually work, this blog feed finder will actually visit the site, the, the software behind the, the scenes will, will visit the actual site and it will look in various places that are common locations for blog uh, feeds and it will, it will check all those different locations. There's a bunch of other ways that it can actually try to identify uh, where the blog feed is on a particular website as well. Uh, and eventually it, it will find the blog feed. So in this case, it's this tech.oeru. You can, I'll just highlight that so you can see. That is the actual feed. Um, the idea is that it provides you with very simple messages to tell you what the status of the process is. Um, also uh, acknowledging um, elaboration theory. If, if a learner wants to know more, they can hover over these information um, uh, icons and they'll get in additional information that will, that will perhaps provide them with additional insight as to what's going on. 
And then if the learner is, is logged into the, the course site and happens to be registered for uh, any courses or enrolled in any, in any specific courses, they will be able to choose to associate that feed with any of the courses that they're uh, enrolled in. So this, this is looking at my, um, I'm, I just happen to be uh, a member of these different courses here in my development version of the site, which is what you're looking at now. And so I can actually replace a, um, I can replace uh, an existing feed that I've allocated to a course just by saying replace and it will, um, it will automatically update that in the background. What else is happening in the background is that this is registering this blog, um, this blog URL is being registered against this course with, the, uh, with this as its um, course code. And so every few minutes, our, our automated systems will actually visit my blog and it will look to see if there are any new posts that have this uh, course tag as a, this course code as a tag. And if it finds any, it will then incorporate a link to them in the uh, course's um, interactive feed. So there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in the background here, but in any case, the idea behind this was to make it a very um, straightforward process for learners to specify blog feeds. And we think we've, um, we think we've uh, achieved a, a useful um, capability here. Uh, interestingly, it turns out that quite a few other people uh, in the, OER world have encountered a similar problem. And in fact, there are people, for example, in Canada who are looking at using uh, this code. They've done a review of, of the blog feed finder that we've written here uh, alongside a couple of other similar efforts. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that at least provisionally, it looks like the blog feed finder is the most effective one. <laughs> so um, there are blog posts that people have posted uh, on the web um, comparing this tool to other tools. Um, just for your reference, um, this is, uh, let's see if I can find it here. This is a article that I've written uh, on this. This is the actual tech.oeru.org uh, site, which includes all the how-tos and um, descriptions of a lot of the different technologies that we have um, been working on here. So if any of your institutions want to explore the technologies that we're using uh, at the OER, with the OERU's learning platform, um, this is the place to look. And, and in many cases, you'll actually get a step-by-step how-to of how to make these things work. And here's the article, if any of you want to see any more information about it um, regarding the blog feed finder. The other, um, the other thing we've done is uh, we, we, we are, um, uh, Course analytics have indicated that a number of people who uh, originally signed up for the inaugural course, the Learning in a Digital Age Part One, uh, the first micro course, 101, um, were not or didn't seem to um, register for 102 and 103 and 104. Uh, and we suspect that there may be a problem with our um, registration process in that it's not um, it's not uh, informative enough to to learners. So we have, um, as another strategic development, we have also um, decided to uh, write a new authentication and registration mechanism. So I'll just qu quickly show you that. So you may or may not be aware that if you go to the uh, course, well, you, you will have seen from what Wayne was uh, showing you previously, um, that on the on, uh, OERU on the OERU course site uh, on each page there's a little uh, bust icon that's down in this in this green bar uh, or in the blue bar in some in some of the courses and a learner has to know to click that to log into the site and to uh, register for a particular course and in fact it doesn't give any obvious visible um, indication that they are registered for a course and so uh, it uses a uh, an implicit registration process, which I think um, uh, is one of the quirks of the WordPress uh, platform. Well, what, what we've done is we've actually decided to create a much more informative approach. Um, so now, for example, when you uh, this this is going to be deployed as soon as we finish the mobile mobile layout components of it. Um, a learner will now see this when they look at a page uh, or a course on the site, uh, and if they click on it 
it gives them the option to log in and, and register. So if they already have credentials, they can log in. If they haven't got them yet, then they can register. And the registration process, um, you know, you'll see that my um, password, my, my browser has filled in some of the components here. So don't, don't be distracted by the, the fact my username and so on are already there. But the, the idea is that um, the, the form is designed to automatically alert the user or the, the, the learner when they're entering their details, when, they're, when they've entered um, incorrect or, or uh, information that is um, doesn't comply with our requirements. So, for example, um, each um, if, if, for example, a username is too short, it will alert them immediately that they need to change it. Um, and another thing it will do typically is it will show that um, if the username already exists, it will let them know that they have to select a unique username and things like that. So it provides a hand holding kind of experience for for making sure that they get into the system and we don't create any barriers to. Um, to allowing them to interact with the system. Um, if, we, if, the, if the learner realizes actually they already have registered, they can immediately go to the login instead. And if you log in, um, now I've got a, uh, the usual um, demonstration blues here. Hang on, I should just add the wrong credentials, I think. <laughs> Ah, okay, well, actually, it turns out that I was already logged in here. Um, so, yes, I'll, I'll just log out again. I think I'd logged in in a different browser uh, browser tab. That's the problem. So I'll just quickly log in again just to show you what that it, it provides. Every step of the way, the idea is that it provides a, um, a clear indication of where the user is in the process of, of logging in. So it tells me that I've successfully logged in. It refreshes the page, and it shows me my name and a picture of me if I've nominated one in the in the um, bar here so the user immediately knows that they're logged in and that they are um, you know it's it's the person that they think it is that's logged in they they can also if they go to an actual course page like for example uh, this learning in a digital age 103 course um, I can show that I'm I'm actually I'm logged in but I'm not enrolled in this particular course um, I'll just refresh this to make sure that it's current session. And if I click on this, I can actually just uh, enroll in a course explicitly. And I should point out that um, the process of enrolling in a course or unenrolling from a course actually does quite a lot of things in the background in this system. Um, so this shows a, just an indicator at a glance that the learner can see that who they are logged in as, and they can see whether they are or aren't enrolled in any given course when they're in that context. So any, on any of the pages related to this course, for example, if I'm on the course feed, for example, um, this information will tell me what my status is in this context. So um, in any case, uh, the, the whole idea is to um, greatly enhance the, the usability from a, a registration and um, user management um, perspective. So does anyone have any questions on that? And of course, we'll take silence as assent, uh, as assent <laughs> or no questions. Sorry, Wayne, I think you're still muted. I trust the engineer to notice it, eh? <laughs> thanks, thanks. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Dave. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, those of us that have been involved in e-learning, will, 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 you know, particularly in the developing world, will, will know that many users don't necessarily have the experience or levels of sophistication to know how all these platforms actually operate. And, you know, as it turns out, when you're having you know, multiple micro courses that are associated with the whole bunch of functionality, it can be quite confusing. So um, we think this is going to be a great help because, you know, we pro provide context specific information, help and feedback. I mean, the, the approach we're wanting to use is to avoid users you know, having to go to the support site, um, but that, you know, we can provide as much information in situ uh, to help learners uh, move forward. So. We, we are hopeful that this is going to make, make a big difference. 
um, in what's happening on the back end. Yep. Right, let me uh, get back to the agenda then. I'll start my screen share. I see my video is hopping a lot. For some other reason. And I asked something, sorry, I, I forgot to ask, to ask you. And please forgive my ignorance, but it's just because I haven't been part of it for, for a while now. Um, the enrollment for the, for the first year of study, is that an open enrollment or is it a specific date that the enrollment, that the registration or enrollment closed? Um, so the response to that question is all of the above. Uh, Rusty, if you can just mute your mic, you're getting a bit of a feedback loop there. Oh, sorry. Um, so, so it's all of the above. For each micro course uh, in the first year of study, there are four offerings. So we've got this perpetual academic year. So we've got four cohort-based offerings that have a fixed start date and a fixed finish date. And the fourth offering is an independent study offering. Uh, which means a learner can start at any time or, and finish at any time they want to. It turns out that learners actually prefer cohort-based offerings to independent study offerings. And, and that kind of makes sense. It's more fun to study with a group, right? Um, but by providing multiple start dates of the same course across the year, we are able to cater for a greater flexibility depending on you know, circumstances. Um, but that process, even though it creates greater flexibility for the learners, uh, increases the complexity of the administration systems by an order of magnitude. Because you've got, you know, you've got all these multiple courses that are running and you've got to have the campaigns or email campaigns associated with the right cohort and learners, you know, if they decide they now want to do independent study, they've then got to change the cohort. And all that process is managed with our marketing automation software engine. So because this is open source, the registrations, people can register from multiple points, right, for a course. They may fill out a landing page on the Mortic site. They may register on the um, course site on WordPress. But our systems are designed in a way that uh, our WordPress API speaks with the Mortic API. So these technologies are, are talking with each other. Um, and it, it's you know invisible to the user what's happening on the back end, but we are uh, you know link these technologies together to be able to scale um, the communications that go out to learners without having to increase staff. So I mean we we'll be able to run you know fifteen twenty thousand learners a year um, without having to increase our staff complement um, you know to do a bunch of these processes. Uh, this is all automated on the back end. If if, if that answers your question, Rossi. It does, Wayne. And uh, now I understand why why you so uh, prepped up with Nordic. Because I mean, this is just a this must be a the problem. Technology is just solving a lot of your problems. Uh, yeah, oh, now I understand. Uh, absolutely, but but not but not only that, we've got tight link, linkages between the marketing and recruitment component of you know, getting information out about the OERU courses to the learners that need them. But at the same time, when they do establish a relationship by registering for a course, we are able to link that data together and provide a better customized experience for the learner. So, so, for example, if a learner arrives and registers at a course, on a course site, we will know if they have completed the orientation email campaign or not. And so if that learner arrives and say, oh, okay, you're a new learner at the OERU, it's a good chance that you don't know how to use our platform. Maybe you need, maybe you'd be interested in the orientation campaign. And so we'll send them to a preference survey saying, hey, do you want to get the orientation emails? And because of GDPE, it's an opt-in system. And if a learner says, hey, I want to get the orientation emails, it's my first course, they will then get a dedicated campaign uh, of the emails that have help them get started. But that's all automated on the back end. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let me move on then. Uh, that's in terms of our technology advancements. 
Uh, we also at that phase of our journey where we are consulting on uh, the strategic plan. So there's a bit of a typo there in the agenda. I said the strategic plan 2018 to 2020. It's actually the strategic plan from 1 July 2018 to the end of 2021. And that will make sense because uh, we decided to wait a little bit, about a couple of months, uh, before uh, preparing the next iteration of the strategic plan, awaiting to find out if we have continuation funding uh, from our offshore donors for you know, part of the work that we're doing. And I'm pleased to report that uh, we do have a renewal for another three years uh, to continue supporting the, you know, the work that we're doing in addition to uh, the revenue we generate from membership fees. The split at the moment is roughly about 70% of our revenue generated from membership fees from our partner institutions and the remainder through donor funding. But you'll appreciate a, a strategic plan with donor funding uh, is a different strategic plan to one without donor funding. So uh, hence the, you know, the little bit of the weight in, in terms of finalizing the plan. But I'm pleased to report that we do have the high level plan. Um, here it's open for consultation. Anyone is more than welcome to comment. Um, at the uh, 2017 uh, International Partners Meeting, the uh, partners ag agreed that the high level goals that we had in the previous plan were still valid uh, for the foreseeable future. So the strategic plan has actually been structured around the existing strategic goals, um, which you'll, you'll see in a moment. But I just wanted to highlight that we do use an evergreen planning model uh, which is in designed to be more agile and responsive. Um, and you'll see that the strategic plan is quite succinct. It's, a, it's basically a two-page document, uh, which is guiding these processes. And at each international partners meeting, we calibrate the KPIs for the operational objectives each year. And we also run a live uh, Kanban, um, or we use the Kanban methodology uh, which is implemented by a CAN board, uh, piece, uh, a CAN board uh, service, which is a piece of open source software that we use to keep track of all this stuff. And I'll show you that in a moment. So you can see how that all fits together. But, you know, you know we have the high level goals here, which are around, you know, the coherent program of study, uh, improving the efficiency of our processes and so forth and so forth with the, um, the strategic objectives situated or associated with each of those goals. Um, in terms of the, the targets uh, that we are pursuing over the next uh, couple of years, uh, we're looking to achieve uh, you know, 25 and a half thousand course registrations from 100 different countries uh, and have implemented 60 micro courses uh, that will be in full operation. Uh, that's more or less the trajectory uh, we're looking at in terms of the release of the micro courses. Um, we've done an estimate of the potential savings based on U.S. data. So, I mean, this is very hard to compare across different countries with different currencies. But we basically know, I mean, we do know what the average cost of tuition is in the U.S. Um, and so we can calculate the savings both in terms of textbooks and um, uh, tuition fees. So, you know, if we're successful, we will generate savings based on U.S. figures, you know, just short of $14 million. Uh, which is not bad for an operation that runs on about an annual budget of about 210,000 uh, US. So we're quite excited about the strategic plan. So what I can show you now is how our CAN board uh, works uh, in relation to the strategic plan. Um, you'll see here at the top there are three columns, right? 2018, 2019, 2020. There'll be a fourth column added 2021 which are obviously each of the calendar years uh, for the duration of the strategic plan. And each of these cards uh, represents the um, main activities or initiatives that we're working with at any given time. So the backlog column here are all the activities that are basically ready to go, but haven't been started yet. And so what you'll see are all the range of the course, course materials that have been published 
that now need to be prepared for uh, actual launch. You know, that's the final audit of the course materials, uh, making sure the pre-assessment moderations, making sure the assessments are aligned with the outcomes. All that's building the MORTIC campaigns on the back end to make sure they're running before we launch. Uh, so, you know, those are the processes we work through in order to get the launch uh, operational. Once we move into the actual uh, column here, the green cards indicate the activities and tasks that have been completed, and the blue cards are the ones that are in process. So this is a publicly accessible uh, document. There's a public URL. Anybody can come have a look and see where we're at with the implementation of the strategic plan. And that's more or less kind of how we work. So you'll see here yeah, we've, uh, you know, we signed off the uh, articulation agreement for the CERT HE business with the University of Highlands and Islands and Thomas Edison State University. Um, we, uh, it's quite interesting, these articulation agreements, uh, I thought would be a lot easier to implement, but there's a lot of work that happens behind the scenes. Uh, you know, all the validation committees, the academic approval processes, before a vice chancellor signs off on these things, they go through the legal department and so we work through all those processes uh, in, you know, to get the, the agreement sorted. So we now have the example agreement, a, a working exemplar that is, you know, will facilitate credit transfer between the US, uh, New Zealand and Canada for the CERT HE. We are now in the final processes of getting the articulation agreement for the Certificate of General Studies sorted. The document is currently under review with, uh, with the legal department at um, Thompson Rivers University. Uh, so we've launched the four micro courses for learning in a digital age. We've launched the four micro courses for introduction to project management. We are finalizing the implementation now of introduction to entrepreneurship. We are uh, also in parallel working uh, with the principles of management course, which we are uh, hoping to have running before the end of the year. So that's pretty much where we're at in terms of the courses. And as we progress, these yellow cards will then shift into uh, the column here. Uh, around the strategic goal for improving our OERU operations, uh, the, the support site has been published. Uh, this is a bunch of internal OERU organizations. So at the previous meeting, we took a number of decisions to rationalize the working group structures. Um, and that's in process. There are a couple of activities that need to be completed there. Um, we have an initiative that's looking at quality guidelines. There'll be a lot of discussion at the next partners meeting around the quality processes. Um, we are fine, you know, we're in the planning for uh, the OERU partner meeting. This consultation meeting is part of that planning process because we'll be looking at the agenda. So you get the idea. I'm, I'm not going to go through all the detail. We've done the GDPR compliance. We've established our own MORTIC instance. We've run the pilot campaigns to figure out how this all works. We've got them working. We've done the improvements on the landing pages to facilitate our marketing. marketing. Blog feed finder has been done. We're finalizing the uh, improvements to the registration process. Um, interesting news and development. Marketing has been one of the hardest pieces of our puzzle. Uh, getting, uh, and I think you'll appreciate uh, both Dave and I are great fans of open source software. Uh, we tend not to have to worry about marketing this stuff. Um, so we're not very good at marketing. And so, you know, the marketing piece for the OERU is, has been a big challenge, but we, we are learning fast. Um, but I'm in final negotiations with an offshore funder who will give us a capacity uh, development grant to appoint a marketing agency to assist us with the marketing uh, aspects of this whole project. Uh, one of the things we qualify for as a nonprofit is the Google AdWords uh, grant, which is 10,000 US of AdWords uh, that we can get for free as being a registered nonprofit. Um, but AdWords and PPC, you know, pay per click advertising is in an extremely complex area it's not straightforward and we just don't have the in-house expertise uh, to do that well so we will get a funding uh, funding support to do that we will be improving our seo we will be launching a corporate citizenship pilot to uh, look at corporate sponsoring more courses we'll be impl implementing paper click campaigns um, 
And what I want to do is run a specific pilot in a sub-Saharan African country to explore what, you know, what effective strategies are in getting the news and information out to learners who would benefit most from uh, the OERU offerings, uh, because I have suspicions that there are going to be significant differences in strategies that would work, for example, in New Zealand uh, uh, when compared to Kenya, for example. Uh, the other initiative that we're working on in the strategic plan uh, for each of the three years, we want to identify innovation pilots, which are small projects where we can test ideas to see how they work in order to improve um, you know, our, our operations. The two strategic pilots we've got on the table at the moment is one, uh, an initiative called Community Learning Hubs, where university libraries and community libraries will offer one or two face-to-face -face support sessions uh, to support learners taking the learning in a digital age course. So uh, we want to be working with our library networks across the universities and community libraries uh, in trialing this uh, initiative in just helping learners get started uh, with the learning in a digital age course. Uh, the other pilot we're going to be working on is I uh, have a generous uh, donation from Proctor U, who is the online proctoring company who have waived establishment fees for us to run a small pilot with online proctoring. Um, and the idea here is that partner institutions that are interested in learning more about online proctoring can join us and walk with us in the process of actually setting this up uh, to assist them in, you know, making um, judgments about the appropriateness of online proctoring for their own environment. So th that's the other innovation pilot we are hoping to work with this um, this year. So let me leave that there uh, in terms of the high-level strategic plan and just check and confirm if you have any comments or feedback. I will be posting an open forum so that if anybody wants to add additional feedback, uh, at a you know at a later stage you'll be able to do that, but for now um, any you know, thoughts and ideas on the strategic plan as it stands at the moment. Well, uh, Rashi, again, I just want to ask: Have you already agreed on whom the university partners will be in the online proctoring testing testing uh, that you're planning? Uh, no, um, we will be making the announcement at the partners meeting and. It's extending an open invitation to all universities in the network who want to be part of that pilot. Uh, in addition, we do have a number of universities that are already uh, using ProctorU. Athabasca University, Thompson Rivers University have been doing a lot of work in this space. Thomas Edison State University used ProctorU. And I learned this morning that Charles Sturt University have been piloting for the last four years. And I'm sure those institutions being part of the family will also come sit around the table and advise us on the lessons that they've learned. But yes, in any of the partners are free to join. Okay, Wayne, so I, I mean, I want to be up front here um, because I don't know what our attendance, we will, we will attend only virtually. So um, I will then, there will be an option when we attend virtually the, the meeting that we can then to be such a partner, am I correct? Or should I just tell you now that you should keep us in mind? Uh, we currently, we are busy with a with the online proctoring and a mark, marking system here at the Northwest University. So I would, I, this, this just fits straight into what we are doing here. So I would, I would love us to be part of it. Uh, fantastic news, Rossi. I'll make sure that um, you, uh, Northwest University are included in the invitations. Um, and you know that, that, that you can join and I'll point you to where you need to sign up and um, just that I've got the contact information for setting up the group. Yep. All good. So that's in terms of the uh, high level strategic plan. Uh, the last item on the agenda is uh, to consult on uh, the agenda we're uh, putting together for the international partners meeting. Uh, every year we run a consultation meeting to determine what the agenda will be. Uh, for those of you that haven't attended a, a, a partners meeting before, uh, our partners meetings are, are essentially planning sprints. 
uh, what we, we, we work on developing proposals for action for developing components of our strategic plan. So we uh, develop the first drafts of uh, these plans for action, which are then refined as we implement them. And basically what we do is we have breakout groups on the, the different uh, components of interest uh, under the strategic plan for people to you know, kind of vote for their feet and where their own interests lie, they'll draw on that group and then work together in uh, developing the proposal for action. Uh, the format that has been working well for us over the past couple of years, we've been running these meetings for seven years. And so we're getting a, an idea of the things that work well. And yeah, well, if you know, it ain't, ain't broke, don't fix it. So there are structural components which we are keeping the same uh, because they've, been, they've worked well for us in the past. Uh, the division of the program is roughly the first day, you know, OERU past and present, uh, you know, we would look at what we've achieved. Um, and then the second day is more of a strategic forward looking focus around the planning. Uh, so, if, you know, for day one, we go through the uh, normal review and reflection, uh, which culminates in the critical friend review, where we have a look at the things that have worked well and the things where we can improve. Uh, based on our history and performance and the statistics and the data we have. And uh, then we'll move into the, the, these possible breakout groups here, focusing on various aspects, the digital marketing project, uh, that's actually you know, sort of planning the implementation of uh, this grant that is coming in to help us with that. Uh, we always have a look at um, you know, sort of the technology plan. Um, this year, we, what we're going to be doing is we trialed this last year. We had the marketing group because, you know, with the bigger projects, they need more time to develop the proposals for action. So last year, we had the marketing group, which had three breakout sessions during the course of the meeting. And this year, around the quality, the folk that are working on the quality initiatives and the quality guidelines will have three breakout sessions to, you know, to really polish and, you know, make good progress with, uh, the work that has been done there. Uh, we're also going to be having a think about, you know, how, how do we improve uh, um, institutional engagement with from our partners? We have a raft of, you know, valuable things that might be of benefit to the partners and, you know, to really have a think about, you know, which of those things would be useful for integrating back, you know, into campus or onto campus. Um, the second day, we're going to be having, uh, talking about these innovation pilots and planning them. Uh, so, you know, we're figuring out the, the steps there that we need to progress around the innovation pilots. There may be one or two more innovation pilots that have been, that were recommended by the other consultation group. Uh, we can have a look at that in a moment. Um, we then this year are running an open uh, uh, panel, uh, an online webinar. Uh, which we haven't done before. Uh, some of you will have seen, we've been sent out some invitations to uh, uh, join this international panel. We have a couple of folk, uh, a couple of panelists who will be uh, presenting on this uh, panel session and it will be open to anyone. So there's a registration page for folk who just want to register for the panel and we have a bit of an associated email campaign which give people instructions on how to engage and we'll send out a little reminder about two hours before the event starts. So that, will, that is lined up for this year. Um, and then, you know, after that, we in focus on the calibration of the KPIs for 2019. Uh, we want to have a look at um, improving our, our partner recruitment. I mean, with the development that's taken place recently, I mean, the value propositions around membership in the OVRU are maturing. We have, we've got a far better idea of what is of value to our partner institutions. So we want to have a conversation around that. Um, we need to uh, continue planning on the process evaluation, which is the next step in the evaluation process. At each of these meetings, the CEs who will be present there will have a breakout session to determine the agenda for the CEO's meeting. That's kind of a standard feature of our OERU international partners meetings. And again, uh, if needed, the third breakout session for the quality groups. That's more or less the high level agenda as we see it at the moment. We had a couple of good suggestions from um, the meeting this morning with, with North America and Oceania. Um, 
there's um, you know keen interest to have uh, a discussion around alternate credentialing in the post credit transfer era, uh, which I think is quite important. Um, the potential and opportunity of open boundary courses, uh, which the OERU can quite easily implement. So, what you know, we'll incorporate that into the agenda. And these ideas around open pedagogy, Paul, I think I referenced them a little bit earlier, where we start having students that are participating on OERU courses actually contributing to improving content for the OERU as, you know, kind of an open pedagogy approach. So that's where we're at in terms of the suggested agenda. And I'll open the floor up for feedback and comments and, you know, any suggestions you might have from your desk. And as always, we'll take silence to be in the set. And um, if you're happy with the sort of broad, uh, broad strokes of the agenda, uh, we can then move forward with populating the uh, meeting website. But I'll wait a bit. Yes, I like hearing silence. Because the agenda is getting pretty full, I'm not sure how we're going to be able to fit um, much more in. It's always a challenge. So that's pretty much the uh, agenda for today. Um, and I'd just like to open up the floor for any you know, general comments, uh, questions uh, that you might have, uh, either in relation to you know, what you've heard here today, but um, any other questions you have. I mean, we don't have the opportunity of connecting that often. Uh, in these synchronous sessions, so please feel free to you know ask any questions you might have around the OERU. Uh, when I just want to ask, we will be joining virtually the meeting in the um, all, all of the meeting will be virtually open, so we will be able to join all of the sessions. Abs absolutely, uh, some of the sessions will be tough for you given the time zone difference. But um, you're most welcome to stay up in the middle of the night. <laughs> but yes, um, all, all the uh, plenary sessions and feedback Sorry. sessions are open, and you're most welcome to, uh, to join, uh, welcome to join with which I just want to mute. Uh, uh, it's interesting, my mute button is dying. There we go. Um, Dave, did you, uh, did you mute that? Uh, I've just got a bit of lag here with the uh, interface. Um, but yes, yeah, you can join any of the uh, virtual sessions. Eurasia, as always, we will be recording them, so you'll be able to catch up afterwards. We will also we also run, uh, I think this year, I haven't had a chat yet with Dave, but I... I suspect we're going to run Etherpad documents. Um, but at any rate, irrespective of the technology solution we'll be running, there will be documents you can contribute asynchronously. So, you know, if you have missed the session or you want to you know, add contributions before the session starts, uh, that will be possible as well because we, you know, we are aware we spread across, you know, literally across 24 time zones. Um, so we need to be providing opportunities for folk in other parts of the world to be able to contribute. Yep. Well, if there are no uh, further questions, I am pretty pleased that um, we've managed to finish before time, and that's always welcome uh, later in the evening here in our time zone. Okay, folk, I really appreciate your time and contribution. Uh, looking forward to the next phase of the OERU. I will be posting uh, the recording of the meeting tomorrow and um, just uh, polishing the notes. But please feel free. At, you know, it is a wiki if you, you want to add anything or you think of something uh, a bit later today. Uh, please feel free to add. And um, look, looking forward to seeing you. Uh, virtually in, at the partners meeting in Australia. Thanks, Wayne. Bye, everybody.
Thanks, Andy. Please, you can make it. See you later. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye bye now. Bye, Serene. Bye bye. Bye. See you later, Paul. See you, Rossi. Goodbye. See you, Yaku. Um.